This is Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I'm excited to be here today talking with Dr. Steve Deeks. He's a professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. We're going to be talking today about the phenomenon of the long-term effects of COVID-19. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Donna. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about your background and how you got interested in the long-term effects of COVID. Well, um, basically, uh, be before COVID, I was a full-time HIV clinician, and I ran a... Uh, a long-term cohort that was basically focused on trying to identify the long-term complications of HIV and its treatment. And, uh, you know, and we work a lot with the infectious disease doctors here in San Francisco. And when uh, the pandemic started in San Francisco, we quickly repurposed our cohort uh, and enrolled, a, you know, a growing number of people with a history of COVID with a really sort of a long-term plan to do what we do with HIV, which is to characterize biologically and clinically uh, some of the long-term consequences. So that's what we're doing. Wonderful. And so tell me, what have you learned about this new phenomenon? <laughs> we, um, we are in the process right now of, of collecting data and trying to do things prospectively and, and as um, uh, systematically as we possibly can. What we've learned uh, is that um, this is a bad thing to get. Um, um, uh, most people you know, do well, but some have these lingering consequences that, that we're trying to figure out what they're like and why they're happening and what to do about them. Um, you know, the thing that the most, the thing that I've learned that's most important for my day-to-day -day living is it's probably better not to get infected than to have to deal with some of this stuff in the long term. And what kind of symptoms are you seeing in these patients with long-term effects? You know, the most, the majority of people that we've seen who've actually had a prior infection who recovered, for the most part, most people are asymptomatic. Um, and I would say that in our experience, maybe a third of people have some lingering issues, primarily malaise, quality of life issues, some of the vague symptoms that have been reported in the press, not uncommon, a persistent cough, some low level fatigue, um, uh, and things along these issues, things that are sort of hard to quantify, but really have a big impact on people's quality of life. I'd say that in our cohort, which we don't think is necessarily representative of the entire pandemic, we're seeing this in maybe up to a third of people initially, uh, with our anecdotal experience being that, that, that these symptoms typically uh, wane with time. Our, our experience is really more aimed at trying to understand the biology rather than the epidemiology. So I just want to just clarify that I think in the larger cohorts that have tried to sort of get at this question of, you know, what's actually happening and how often it, I think the numbers there are smaller. I think probably the, night, the, the, the most robust cohort that have tried to get an issue of the epidemiology here suggests that this phenomenon, this post-COVID syndrome, is occurring in maybe about 10% or so of people. But the carefully well done population-based cohort with proper controls to figure this stuff out. And have you found any treatments that are effective in treating and helping these patients? Oh, no. I mean, in terms of this post-COVID stuff, uh, no, we're, we're really at that point where we're trying to collect the data to identify what is the problem, collect, do the biologic studies to understand the potential mechanism, and then once that has happened, um, then we can begin to think about what kind of therapies might be uh, helpful for this population. But for the most part, again, I, I don't want to over um, sensationalize it. Most people are doing well. But for those who do have lingering issues that are affecting their quality of life uh, at, at our hospital and many of the academic centers around the world, we're developing these, you know, these post-COVID clinics, which are really supportive right now, providing people with access to the kind of um, psychosocial support that they need and some physical therapy and that kind of thing. So those are the only kind of therapies that are now being administered. But I think once we have a good ID mechanism, then we'll begin to, to develop therapeutics. Do you have any thoughts on how long it'll take before you have some more answers? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> it's like vaccines, right? So therapeutic vaccines for prevention typically take about a decade or so to develop and COVID time, it's about a year, a year and a half. So, um, you know, everything is super rushed right now. Uh, everything is high priority. Multiple people are doing um, complimentary work. Uh, I, I have a feeling over the next, um, I've noticed over the past few weeks in the press in particular that this, this issue 
of the sort of the long-term COVID consequences, so-called long haulers, is getting a lot of attention. And I have a feeling that the resources are going to shift to help those of us who are interested in the biology to figure this up out. Uh, right now, we, we, we are beginning to do deep studies uh, looking at the uh, inflammatory response to the infection, the, uh, the immune function, um, coagulation status, this kind of thing. So I, I think us and other groups will come up with um, an idea of potential mechanisms over the next few months, and then we'll start doing therapy, therapeutic studies, right? So, so what, you know, we can dis discuss what is happening, but again, it's, 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 it's kind of vague. It's real. It, it's maybe 10% uh, of the total population. Uh, it's more common in people who are older, who are sicker to begin with. Might be more common in women than men. Some studies suggest that. I'm trying to figure that out. The natural history so far to me suggests that it's, it's, uh, um, it does wane in time with most people, uh, which is good news, but we don't really know that yet. And there's no good longitudinal data. You know, in terms of mechanisms, you got several, right? Possible ones. You got that the virus could be there, that it doesn't go away. It, it replicates, it's persistent, particularly in tissues, in which case the treatment would be better antivirals. Right, and there's I, I'm personally excited by the monoclonal antibodies that are being developed. These um, antibodies that bind to the virus. So in theory, um, if, if it's persistent virus, we can actually treat people with either antivirals and these antibodies make them better. If it's an inflammatory response, well, there are low-level, um, you know, re reasonably well been um, well maintained well. Um, uh, tolerated anti-inflammatory drugs that could be tested. Some people are now actually using prednisone because of this reason. Um, if it's immunodeficiency, lack of interferon response, which is a growing concern in terms of acute SARS-CoV-2, there are ways to deal with that as well. If it's a thromboembolic event and clotting and persistent clots and so forth, um, anticoagulation therapy could be used. All this can be done, but also typically in a context of, of providing the supportive care that, that this population needs. And so for patients, any patients in our network that may be struggling with this, um, you know, dealing with these long-term effects, you talked about supportive care that they should be seeking out. Is there anything in particular, any recommendations that you have for those, those folks who maybe are not under a physician's care right now as to what their next steps would be? Uh, I would, you know, I, 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 I think the key thing would be to get into these um, uh, supportive clinics if they're around and, they, and, they're, and they're, they're coming, they're, they're being developed everywhere, you know, and I, and I but I think actually importantly, <laughs> um, I think people realize that, you know, initially I think that there was some suspicion in the medical community that this is real because we've seen these types of symptoms before and they're, they're kind of vague and they're hard to diagnose and there's no no measurement that we can look at. And so people are always a bit dubious about it. Um, I don't think that that's really an issue. You know, I think everybody is absolutely convinced that this is a syndrome. It's happened before. It happened in people with the first SARS pandemic. It happens in people who've had Ebola, other sort of acute viral infections. It's a well-known phenomenon of a sort of post-viral syndrome. Um, so I, I just think just acknowledgement that this is actually real and no longer controversial, I think would help people. Uh, and then, and then the supportive care, which which is going to have to be individualized, and some of it's going to have to social economic. I mean, people who are disabled and can't work, and so they're going to need support in that regard, physical therapy and this kind of stuff. Well, I I appreciate you saying that, and I know that uh, that all of our the folks in our network that are struggling this appreciate that as well, because there are they they have been told that uh, it's it's not real. Right, and so which is associated with some stigma, right? And I'm very familiar with stigma as a long-term health issue in our HIV population. Most of the medical stuff associated with HIV, but there is this widespread stigma still associated with being HIV infected, and that has a huge impact on people's you know quality of life over years and decades. And so, I think society and the medical establishment needs to be very careful about this particular syndrome because we don't have to become stigmatized because that in itself becomes negative. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, with comments from Tony Fauci and others recently suggesting this is a real phenomenon, 
So we, it's a medical condition. It's like any other medical condition. We've got to understand that we've got to treat it. I'm, I'm hoping that societal stigma won't become an issue. Well, thanks, Dr. Deeks. That was so great. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing with us what is happening right now at the University of California at San Francisco. Now we'd like to speak with Dr. Jake Stewart. He is an anesthetist and an intensive care physician in the United Kingdom who has been personally dealing with the effects of this post-COVID syndrome. Welcome, Jake. Nice to see you today. Thanks for having me. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background, Jake? So uh, I'm a 32-year-old. Uh, I was working as an intensive care doctor in, in March 2020. Uh, I've trained in medicine, trained in uh, anesthetics, and was about to start a new job in Australia. I was very active, went to the gym three to four times a week, and uh, otherwise healthy, um, active lifestyle. Wow, so you're not the typical patient that we hear about. Um, you know, we hear a lot about how this, this illness is affecting mostly the older population, those with uh, you know, chronic conditions. So I'd love to, for you to tell us just a little bit about what your experiences were with COVID. So we were looking after patients with COVID in, in, involved in intubating three patients that required ventilation on the intensive care unit. Uh, I had uh, attended cardiac arrest calls from patients that we suspected had COVID-19 in our accident and emergency departments. So I'd had contact with patients who we knew had the virus. Um, about two weeks after my first contact, uh, I started to have symptoms. Uh, at the time, we were being told that the three symptoms to look out for were fever and dry cough and shortness of breath. And for me, actually, the shortness of breath came first. I was being woken up in the middle of the night with shortness of breath. And by the morning, it had gone away. Uh, the next night, it was a bit worse. And then the following day, I started to have temperatures and a dry cough. And at that point, I self-isolated and, and realized that this was probably COVID-19. I'd assumed as you said, being young, that I would fight this off quite quickly and that it wouldn't be too much of a problem. But each night, the symptoms took a step upwards in severity each night. Uh, and that's very frightening when the symptoms are shortness of breath. So by the 10th night, I was gasping for breath. Uh, I could not catch my breath even just laying still on my bed and I decided that I should go and get checked out in the hospital to make sure that something else wasn't going on or, or to check that I didn't need any extra treatment. When I got there um, my blood test showed that I had some kind of inflammation going on in my body, my neutrophils were raised, uh, my liver function tests were deranged, my thyroid function tests were deranged but I didn't require oxygen and at the time, testing wasn't available for patients that were not being admitted to the hospital. So I was told that I probably had COVID, but that I could go home and that I should recover shortly. Uh, the following week, I tried to push through my symptoms. I was still very, very short of breath, but I was forcing myself to walk around, uh, walk around the park, try to get myself fit as though I could convince my body to just get on with it. And when I did that, the, the shortness of breath got worse. And on top of that, I started to have uh, a very cardiac type chest pain on my, on my left side as well. Uh, I then started to have palpitations. I had episodes of tachycardia at rest. I had episodes of bradycardia at rest. Uh, I had ongoing temperatures, I had waves of fatigue, so wasn't my main symptom, but I could be doing something like washing up or, or trying to do some laundry and then just like click of the fingers, 
this sense that I would fall asleep almost standing up. Um, so very, very difficult symptoms, very, very frightening. And um, for about six weeks, uh, I was still short of breath, just trying to eat, just sitting on the sofa. It was, it, it's very traumatic symptoms to feel that short of breath. And uh, I'm now about six and a half months on and things are um, considerably improved. Uh, but I'm still short of breath if I walk up a flight of stairs. Um, it's, it's definitely had a, a life changing impact on me. I know you're involved with several groups that are of, of, of individuals who are also dealing with this. How widespread of an issue have you found this to be? I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, in the first five or six weeks, I didn't know if anyone else was affected like this. And I wondered if I was the only person uh, struggling to recover. Uh, but Paul Garner, who's a, a professor in the United Kingdom, uh, wrote about his recovery in the British Medical Journal at around five or six weeks into my illness. And he had found uh, online other patients, other people living with the same symptoms and mentioned how helpful he had found the, the ability to share what we were going through. So I found some of those uh, support groups through that article and started to realize that there were thousands of us in these groups and that nobody was recording how many people this was happening to. So I think it's fair to say that we don't really know how many people this is happening to, but there's thousands of people in these groups saying that this is what's happening. And I think part of the problem is that there, certainly in the United Kingdom, there was no structured way to follow up what happened to people uh, after they had a positive test or after they had a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and so there was not any kind of centralized system for following people up. Um, the other hope that I had was that there might be enough patients presenting to um, kind of tertiary care centers like infectious diseases centers that a pattern may emerge that this was a problem, but that also seemed to not be happening very quickly because of how overwhelmed health services were with the acutely unwell patients. So a couple of things started to happen, which ended up raising the issue of how many people were affected. And that was that individuals started to speak out in the media and, and sort of share their personal experiences. But also uh, there is a, a research study using the Zoe Symptom Tracker app, which uh, is being led by Professor Spector at King's College London, which involves about 4 million people inputting data into an app each day about their, their health. And the emerging evidence from that app is that about 10% of people who have COVID still have symptoms after one month. And about three, uh, about 2% still have symptoms after three months. So it does seem as though it's not the vast majority of people, but it doesn't seem to be linked to uh, the same cohorts of people that you would expect to have the highest risk of mortality. So this is affecting young people as well. And 2% is, is a relatively low figure, but when you consider that the World Health Organization has estimated that 780 million people have probably been infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 now, um, that's obviously a much larger number than the laboratory confirmed cases. Uh, but if you imagine that 2% of 780 million people, that means that we're probably looking at at least 16 million people around the globe who are still having 
uh, very difficult symptoms three months on. And in addition, nobody knows really what's causing them and what happens. So it's a very strange situation uh, and definitely needs more research and more structured epidemiological studies to really work out how many people it affects and what are the risk factors and you know do we need to adjust the way that we're thinking about our public health measures here wow those are quite sobering statistics and i'm grateful to dr deeks for doing that research that you spoke about um, I wonder if, do you have any recommendations for others that may be struggling with uh, long COVID or post COVID syndrome? I think I would recommend people to firstly uh, contact their uh, medical professionals that can help them. I think a lot of the symptoms that people are experiencing uh, outside of a pandemic uh, time would warrant uh, urgent medical investigation. So things like breathlessness and chest pain and uh, weakness and you know, neurological symptoms. If people have symptoms, they need to present to a medical professional so that firstly, uh, we can rule out known complications of COVID-19. So we know that patients can have uh, blood clots, we know that patients can have myocarditis. So it's about ruling out medical problems that can be treated. And then also I think it's about ruling out non-COVID causes of those same symptoms. So it's important that people do present and get the help that they need from a medical professional. But also in terms of handling the disease, handling the symptoms, I think it's helpful to uh, find some support from other people going through the same things. It is really difficult to deal with these symptoms and I'm sure it would be really difficult to deal with these symptoms at the best of times, but at the moment uh, it's a very difficult time in the whole world if you like. I think people are, everyone is, is concerned about their safety uh, there's lots of uncertainty out there. It's hard to get listened to and to, to get help in some way. So I think make contact with other people who can understand what you're going through, find some support and try to talk about it with uh, friends or family that you trust because some people uh, will be able to be there for you. They might not be able to give you an answer, but they can, they can certainly support you through uh, what you're going through. And then finally, I would say to try to stay as optimistic as you can. It's, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by this. So I think we have to say, look, uh, the word is getting out there. We have uh, made the researchers aware of the problem. Let's see what science can come up with and keep going, don't give up. That's excellent advice. Well, I know you mentioned that you're not quite completely recovered yet and we wish you very uh, well and hope that you recover shortly. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Good luck to you, Jake. Thanks a lot.